welcome Dr. Jairaman for IPF exclusive video interview. Thank you, Rafi. Uh, to start with, you know, today uh, LG has is one of the leading global players in the air uh, compressors market. Uh, how, how do you describe this journey? Well, our journey has been for a very long time. It has been going on for the last uh, 20, 25 years. Uh, it really started with the opening up of the economy, Indian economy in the early 90s, uh, where the licensing system was dismantled and uh, India was integrated into the rest of the world. And at that time, we realized that uh, on one hand, there is a huge opportunity for us globally. Uh, and at, on the other hand, if we are not a globally relevant player, uh, we will not be alive even in the Indian market because most of our competitors in India are multinational global players. So we had to be uh, at the very least as good as them, if not better than them. So that's when our journey started. And if you look at any business in, in for any business, the global opportunities are exponentially higher than the Indian opportunity. And that made a lot of sense for us too. But to take a, a, a India focused business and to transform it to be a globally centric uh, business and organization, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it's a very long process, especially in manufacturing uh, of capital equipment. So we had to lay a lot of foundation on our technology, our product development, our manufacturing systems, our people systems. Uh, so all this took a long time because it, uh, it, had, it was transformational change, transactional changes. So, uh, and really our, our uh, credible growth into international markets has really been only in the last maybe eight to 10 years. And in this eight to 10 years, we've been able to establish ourselves quite credibly uh, in all the difficult markets. I mean, we are not talking about selling sporadically into, uh, you know, Africa, or Middle East or uh, Latin America. This is about sustained presence and growth in some of the most difficult markets like Europe or the US or Australia. And we have demonstrated that. And that's the journey that will continue for the organization. So uh, during your rise on the global landscape, uh, what are the challenges did you face and uh, how did you overcome these challenges? So, you know, as part of laying the foundation to, you know, I call it the right to play, you know, to you need to first lay the foundation for the right to play. And that means getting your technology levels up uh, to a point where you just not have the know-how, but you also have the know-why of the technology, right? So to do that takes time and it takes a lot of partnership. It takes a, makes a, you make a lot of mistakes along the way and you need to build enough stamina within the organization to withstand and actually encourage these failures. And that's where you learn from. So technology was a very big uh, foundation challenge and we had to do it uh, not by licensing because licensing means you'll be restricted to India. We had to build it on our own and which meant that, uh, you know, partnering with different people, different organizations, different universities all over the world and building it piece by piece. So that was a big challenge. Mm -hmm. The second challenge is, you know, quality, uh, in order to compete in markets globally, uh, and especially for an unknown brand and a made in India label, failure is just not acceptable. So it's not about uh, making, very high standards, but making products that are better than the best. So to transform an organization which is not used to that standards of quality uh, in terms of process, in terms of people mindset, was another big transformational change that we had to go through. And then finally, it is about strategy. You know, you, you can't be a global player by being uh, everything for everybody all over. So you have to make some very deliberate choices in which products you want to focus on, which markets you want to focus on. So that's a big, that is a learning, uh, it's a learning journey. You make some mistakes, you think this is the right way, 
and you change it. So now we are firmly on the saddle on all these three uh, dimensions, and we are moving along. How is the market for air compressors in India, uh, and uh, which end user industries are the key uh, demand drivers for your products? So I'm going to talk about the pre-COVID-19 period because right now it's uh, there is no question of talking about demand. Uh, on a steady state basis, uh, India represents, in our estimate, close to about five to six percent of the global market. Uh, and uh, you know, air compressor is a compressed air is a utility, and the air compressor uh, provides that utility. It's like a generator. It generates electricity, and electricity is a utility, right? So just about every manufacturing industry uh, company needs uh, compressed air, and therefore it needs compressors. So uh, it's a good thing in our business because we are not dependent on any one uh, industry as a big contributor for our business, and therefore the risks are lower. Uh, so I can't think of even one industry that contributes to more than maybe three or four percent of our revenue. So what do you bring to the table to your customers? So the, you know, if you look at a compressor, uh, the 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 biggest life cycle cost uh, in a compressor is uh, mm -hmm. energy consumption. Close to seventy-five percent of the life cycle cost. Of a compressor is energy and compressed air itself is not a very efficient source of energy it has got a lot of other virtues like safe easy to transport easy to use but it's got inefficiency so our value proposition to our customers is we bring some of the best efficiencies in the world uh, and therefore when, when they buy and use our compressors the savings are pretty significant uh, and the second thing is, if you look at the second dimension of life cycle cost, is is the maintenance cost. And our compressors have the lowest maintenance cost in the world. So uh, combine these two, the customer's value proposition is very high. So uh, how is LG embracing uh, new technologies like advanced automation, IoT, etc., into its manufacturing? I think each of if you take the digital digitization as a as a new kind of a direction that the whole world is pursuing, uh, we need to pause and consider what exactly is digitization. You can't do uh, you can't dig, do digitization for the sake of digitization. Digitization is an enabler of the company's operations and strategy. So you need to understand what are all the biggest uh, either pain points or the biggest opportunities that you have that can be resolved very elegantly with a digital solution, right? So take, keeping that in mind, we are focusing first on the customer and say, how can we enhance our customer's experience with our products and our company uh, through a digital experience? So one of the things that we have done is, uh, is a global platform for uh, IoT, where all our machines will be connected. The way we have architected the solution is a very affordable architecture. So we can pretty much extend this facility to um, almost all customers, irrespective of the size of the compressor. Now, the value proposition for a customer for the customer is basically with that device, we will be able to significantly in reduce the downtime for the and we do that by being able to predict a failure rather than react to a failure. Right? So when, when we are able, have the ability to predict failures through our IoT platform, and by the way, we call it Air Alert, uh, and this is something that we will use increasingly to enhance the customer's experience, not only with the product, but also with the company. So that's an example. And we are using IoT inside our factory to constantly look at how we can improve productivity and quality, right? So that's about uh, more efficient, instant uh, gathering of data that will give us agility in our decision. Uh, according to you, a person who has traveled across 
the world. So what are the strengths and the weaknesses of an Indian entrepreneur? An Indian entrepreneur is uh, an extremely resilient person, right? We have, we, you know, when you operate in India, you don't operate, uh, you operate under extremely tough conditions, uh, restrictions, uh, lack of resources, uh, the infrastructure is not as good as the rest of the world. So as much as you concentrate on the, the fundamentals of your business, you also need to manage the environment uh, and there is so much of distraction there, right? By virtue of all this, an Indian entrepreneur has become very, very resilient. So with a resilient entrepreneur, you put him in an environment where the environment takes care of itself and supports you. Your ability to produce results is just phenomenally more, right? Uh, so that's on the positive side. But on the negative side is that, you know, right from independence, we have always been an inward looking country, right? And because of our inward looking mindset and psyche, we always look at as an India out opportunity rather than a global in opportunity, right? So we need to, that's a weakness. We need to make a mental shift whereby we, we look at the world as an opportunity. And by the way, I will also sell in India rather than say, oh, I make it in India. Oh, and by the way, I will sell it outside of India, right? So that shift has to happen. So you're basically talking about having a global outlook to your business rather than having a local uh, dimension to your business. Yeah, it's global centricity. It's not even an outlook. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what kind of new opportunities are you exploring uh, uh, globally as well as in India? We are steadfast in our commitment to remain in the compressible. And of course, the compressor business has got a very wide saddle. And uh, even though we play in close to 80% of the of that of that space, there are opportunity for improvements and expansion in the adjacencies in that. Right. So we are constantly looking to expand that portfolio that we give to the customer, so that we are able to give them a complete solution. So that's an ongoing process. Uh, as a and in technology also we are looking at how can we create breakthrough changes uh, that uh, that that opportunities for which exist so i'll give you an example i mean when you know when the smartphone first came they were, all had buttons right uh, nobody would have even imagined that uh, phones would become you know just touch screens and no buttons right so what is that? What is a similar transformation for the compressor, right? And we see there are opportunities of a similar nature, right? And we are pursuing and we are developing those kinds of technologies inside the company. So this is really the envelope that we are working. So uh, uh, because of COVID uh, a pandemic, uh, yeah. how are you recalibrating your growth plan for this year as well as the next year? So our, we continue to be even more committed to our aspiration called CK2, which is Conquer K2 to be number two in the world. We are, uh, in fact, we are more committed to it now than before. Uh, so that, that remains, that has not changed. We are not even uh, for a minute reconsidering it, not at all. But this is a crisis which has two critical dimensions. One, we need to understand what is the bottom of this crisis, right? How, uh, what, when, at what will be the bottommost point that the company will hit, right? And the second is how long will it take for it to recover from this bottom, right? So these are the two dimensions that are critical for us to calibrate as accurately as possible. The situation is very uncertain, so it's very difficult to put an exact number on it. So you have to work with multiple scenarios and say that it could be this, it could be that. So you work with multiple scenarios and you create, create 
financial stamina inside the organization to be able to withstand whichever scenario comes in right now when the way the world looks like uh, it's going to think that the, the drop the bottom is going to be a pretty large percentage drop for all businesses it's not maybe there are some businesses like pharmaceutical basic food essentials fmcg they will continue to sustain at a reasonably good level but most other businesses would hit a deep bottom now when you hit a deep bottom like that the current business model that you've been running uh, is no longer relevant you know if you take a norm a simple financial crisis or an economic crisis you can retain your business model tweak your uh, financial parameters a little bit and continue on but this situation is going to be so deep that you need to go back and revisit your fundamental assumptions of your business model recalibrated reoriented and redirect so how you started operations at your plants yes and we have operation. yes we have but in a very you know very calibrated way uh, it's not like <coughs> excuse me it's not like there is a huge demand that is pent up and available uh, even the demand side is uh, is going to take time to recover so as a consequence we are we are you know doing a graded kind of a wrap up of our facility okay so finally uh, what what are your long term uh, growth goals for sg uh, our long term aspiration like i told you is ck2 which is stands for conquer k2 and k2 is the second tallest mountain in the world and the most difficult one to climb and that kind of represents uh, our ambition which is to be number 2 in the world so that's really our long term direction now we have calibrated that long term direction into specific medium term short to medium term strategies and we are focused on rolling them out and we have certain key markets that we want to focus on we are investing into those key markets as a means to grow them and that's really what this journey is all about for us could you tell us on what are which are the key markets for you so we are now operating in about 100 countries right and we will continue to do that right but that's business as usual we continue to work with our distributors in those but there are strategic markets which is australia indonesia thailand india europe and the us right these six geographies are strategic which means that we will invest disproportionately in terms of our time in terms of our resources and in terms of people to be able to gain traction into these markets uh, thank you dr jairaman for spending time with ipf and uh, all the best for uh, 2020 and beyond thank you very much pleasure to be here thank you